tonight. Second uh, Samuel chapter 11, where we're at tonight. Second Samuel chapter 11. We're in a section that's known as David's great sin. You know, as he opens up, there's, we're to see a progression of sin in David's life, the downward spiral. And most of the time, and I would say every time, it always starts with disobedience. Not obedient to what God would have us to do. Not listening to the voice of God and following the Lord. David's disobedient is not being in the ministry that God has called him to. Not being doing what the Lord had given him to do. God has given each and every one of us things that he would have us to do as far as the body of Christ. You know, and when we're not obedient to that calling, we suffer from it and, and we give way to other things. Well, sometimes people say to me, you know, well, I got out of ministry because it was too hard. Or, you know, life is good now. God's really blessing me. I always scratch my head at that one. You know, ministry, if you would go up and talk to Paul, Paul the Apostle about ministry, he would say, oh, like our pastor, remember Pastor Chuck, Chuck would talk about ministry? He said, simply say, it's glorious in his beautiful way of saying it. Paul would say something along that. But ministry is a battle. You know, he, Paul says it's like running a race. And if we escape that and we try to run away from it, also we get this uh, time of glee and feeling good about life. But yet we miss out on the blessings that God has called us to do and do. And so in verse 1, we open up about David. It says that it came to pass after the, after the year was expired. At, and at the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab and his servant with him and all Israel. And they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. And so here we see, and as, of course, as he finishes, and David tarried still at Jerusalem. So we see the first step of this downward spiral, don't we? What was David? He was the king. What also was David? He was the commander. He was the general over the armies. But as we talked about last week, last Sunday morning, we find David being at a place where he didn't belong back in Jerusalem. As it tells us that they had basically what they did at this time, we'll see later on in the scriptures, that Joab had laid siege against the city. And a lot of times, and as you study the warfare, when somebody would lay siege against a city, it would take quite a bit of time. Maybe David didn't want to lay around in the cot for quite a bit of time. And he started thinking, as you know, it's pretty nice that house I had built for myself. And I'm the king, and I should go where I want to go and do what I want to do. But what we see him, you know, that he's tarried still at Jerusalem. Really, another way of saying it, he's just hanging out. Not being involved with the things God had given him to do and just checking out. And so when we see, first of all, his shirking his responsibility as commander. The second thing we notice in verse 2, it says that it came to pass at evening time that David arose from off of his bed and walked upon the roof and the kings uh, uh, of the king's house. From the roof, he saw a woman washing herself and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. And so here we see, first of all, he's laying on the bed. He's restless. And, you know, like we've always heard before that idle times is whose playground? It's the devil's playground, right? And all of a sudden you start thinking, I'm just going to go wandering upon uh, the rooftop. I don't know how casual that was or if he was purposeful or not, but he went out there and this woman is beautiful to look upon and she's bathing herself. And this idea where he saw a woman, in the original language, is isn't like a, you take a glance, like, oh, oh, I shouldn't look over there. You know, like you see something, whoa, and your head turns right away. It's like he lurked upon her or gazed upon her and, and got himself a really good look what was happening down there. And verse 3, and David sent and inquired after the woman. And one said, is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Elam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And so we see the third thing is now David 
is using his place of authority and of power, being the king. And he started to inquire about this woman. And some person, it doesn't say the person's name, you know, and I think it's so often the Holy Spirit always is looking to keep us from sin. He'll give us different warnings. He'll give us, in this case, he brought somebody to David and say, Hey, David, don't you know what you're doing? This woman is Uriah's wife. And if you do these things, what are you doing? You're committing adultery. And so this guy comes. But yet in verse 4, And David sent messengers and took her. Even though God was warning him, he still was allowing his lusts and his passions to overrule the day. And he took her, and she came in under her, unto him, and, laid with, and he laid with her, for she was purified from her uncleanness, and she returned unto her house. He probably thought, he says, you know what, everything's okay. Isn't this amazing? The best that we could tell that, you know, we might think of David just having a one-night stand with Bathsheba. And we think that life is okay, that I got away with it. That God's not going to pay attention to what I, I was doing. You know, in our today's bulletin, if I could find it, the verse that we had, I think it's very interesting. It goes in Psalm 50. In Psalm 50, um, down, down around verse 21, it says in verse 50, he says, These things has uh, thou done, and I've kept silent, that uh, though thou that thought that, that I altogether such as one of thyself. Otherwise, he says, because I kept silent, you thought that I was agreeing with you, that I, it was okay for what you're doing. And some way or another, as he came and he kept his silence, and he said, but I reprove thee and set thee in order before thine eyes. Notice verse 22. Now consider this, ye that forget God, lest I to tear you into pieces, and there be none to deliver thee. That's pretty powerful, right? But here's David at a point in his life that he's not listening to the Lord. He's listening to his lust. He's listening to his own wants. He's listening to his selfishness instead of listening to God. But the story doesn't end there. This one night stand, he thought, he says, everything's cool. Everything's okay. Verse 5, and the woman conceived. She got pregnant and, and sent and told David and said, I'm with child. Uh, you know, how long does it take for a woman to know she's pregnant, right? It takes a little time. So some time had passed, and David's still at the house, not being out there and, and where he's supposed to be, leading the troops. And all of a sudden he gets a, I don't think they tweeted back then or got an email or anything. I don't know how it was communicated. You know, maybe David would just kind of walk along having a great day, all of a sudden gets word. You remember that gal Bathsheba? You had that one night with her? She's pregnant. I can't imagine his countenance changing. How about you? Realizing he's in trouble. And so what does David do? Not only does he, he, he oh, diso disobeys the Lord, he, as even as he had an opportunity to stop, he committed adultery with this woman. So often what people will do is try to cover their sins. And it says, And David sent to Joab, verse 6, saying, Send me Uriah the Hittite, and Joab sent Uriah to David. And when Uriah was come unto him, David demanded of him how Joab did, and how the people did, and how the war was prospering. Do you, do you think that was really in David's mind at this time, to find out what was going on? And David said to Uriah, Go down to that house and wash thy feet. And Uriah, Uriah departed out of the king's house, and there followed him a mess of meat from the king. And so here he, David is sending him a banquet to his house. He says, just go down there. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of the Lord and went down, not down to his house. David's got a problem here, doesn't he? And when they had told David, saying, Uriah went not down unto his house, David said unto Uriah, Camest thou not from thy journey? Why then didst thou not go down to thy house? And Uriah said unto David, The ark 
in Israel and Judah abide in tents. And my Lord Joab and the servants of my Lord are camped in the open field. Shall I then go to my own house to eat and drink and, and to lie with my wife as thou livest? And as thy soul liveth, I will not do this thing. Isn't it? You almost want to say, man, what a guy. What a guy this Uriah is. He says, I'm not going to come against my you know, compadres, the guys I fight with. He says, they're out in the field. Who am I to take advantage of my opportunity here? And so you think that would stop David? No, because David has a problem, doesn't he? He, had a, he committed adultery with Bathsheba. He's got a baby coming along the way. It sounds like she must be not that far along because he sent Uriah there, hopefully to cover up the problem. In verse 12, and David said to Uriah, Tarry here today also, and tomorrow I will let thee depart. So Uriah abode in Jerusalem that day and, and tomorrow. And when David called him, he did eat and drink before him, and, and he made him drunk. Notice that. And David got him drunk. I know how to fix him. I'll just get him, you know, top, you know, drinking as much wine and much whatever he had. And at evening he went out to lie on his bed with his servants, his Lord, but went, uh, went not down to his house. Uriah, all the way down to the core of his being, he says, I'm not going to do this thing. You would think a normal guy, if he's a little tipsy, he's going to say, hey, where's my wife at? And he's going to head on home to spend the evening with his wife. But he says, I'm not going to do this. I made a commitment, and I believe Uriah had commitment, made a commitment to God to do things that are right. Are right. And it came to pass, in verse 14, that it came to pass in the morning that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. What are we starting to see here? And I'm not an attorney or a lawyer. Or, you know, maybe some of you guys had that, a background. But what I start seeing here is premeditated murder. Where he's, you know, you start thinking, oh my goodness, this king is a bad dude. And yet it goes on, he says, and he wrote the letter saying, Set ye Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle, and retire ye from him, that he may be smitten and die. And so you you got to remember, he's writing this letter. It's like Uriah sitting over right across the way from him. And he knows how faithful Uriah is, as he's going to roll up that scroll and give it to him and have him take it back to Joab. And he knows that Uriah will not open that up. It probably had the king's seal and everything. And so he probably thought he's got everything done. And it came to pass, in verse 16, when Joab observed the city, that he uh, assigned to Uriah unto the place where he knew the valiant men were. And the men of the city went out and fought with Joab, and there fell some of the people of the servants of David, and Uriah the Hittite died also. I think it's so tragic when you think of sin. Certainly when you look at the core of what sin does, it's always a selfish motivation. But the people that it hurts... The people around us that hurt, that we can hurt because we want our own self-gratification. Certainly in David's eyes, that's all he was looking for. Look at what the people that he's destroying uh, up to this point. And already to the death of Uriah. It says, and then Joab in verse 18 sent and told David all these things concerning the war. And charged the messenger, saying, When thou hast made an end of telling the matters of the, war, uh, of the war unto the king, and if it be so that the king's wrath arise, and say unto thee, Wherefore approaches ye so nigh unto the city? When ye did fight, know ye not that they were, uh, would shoot from the wall? Who smote the Ab 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 Amalek and the son of uh, Jerotha Besheth? I'll try that one five times. Did not a woman cast a piece of millstone upon him from the wall that he died there at Thebes? Otherwise, he says, there's a real danger when you come close to the wall. 
He says, either the guys are going to get up on that wall and they're going to get their archers and shoot right down there. It's all fair game. Or one of the ladies inside are going to grab a piece of ro uh, some big rock and start chucking it over the wall. That, he says, don't you remember that's what happened to us? And some of the people were killed. And he says, but then he goes on, why, why went ye near the wall? Then say also, thy servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. So Joab knows there's something rotten back at Jerusalem. There's something going on. And he's, a, as being a soldier, I think all of you guys and women who have served in the service of one way or another, you know there's a responsibility to follow command and the things they, they give you to do. And one thing they do is they never ask you to question what the leader had given you to do. you think at this time that Joab would at least said something, but he didn't. In verse 22, so the messengers went out and came and showed David all, the, all that Joab had sent him for. And the messengers said unto David, Surely the men prevailed against us and came out unto us, the, uh, us into the field, and we were um, upon them even unto the entering the gate. And the shooters shot from the, off the wall upon the servants, and some of the king's servants be dead. And thy servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. And so this messenger, now you, he's back in Jerusalem. He's now there at David's house, and he's letting them know all this. And David said unto the messenger, Thus shalt thou say unto Joab, Let not this thing displease thee. For the sword devoured one as well as the other. Make the battle more strong against the city. Overthrow it, and encourage thou him. I think David probably was, he's thinking this is the best news I've heard in a long time. Problem solved. And he, say, he says, and when Uriah, when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband was dead, she mourned for her, her husband. And when the morning, uh, morning was past, David fetched her into the, to the house and she became his wife and buried his son and put the, put the thing that David had done uh, but he says, but the thing that David had done did what? Displease the Lord. So he, the, the big cover-up's over with. Everything's okay. David has now killed Uriah, the husband. There's no problem. He brought Bathsheba to the house real quickly, became married to them. And so now as she starts showing that she's pregnant, nobody would even question it. Nobody even would think about, uh, you know, that he had committed adultery. But the thing displeased God. One of the lessons, great lessons that you can learn from this story, that the eyes of the Lord go to and fro throughout the earth. They're always upon us. He sees us. There's nothing that we can do that, that God doesn't know and he doesn't see. But some way or another, David thought he was free from that. And that he was no longer at this point that humble shepherd boy that we were introduced a long time ago. He's now at this place where maybe he thought that he was king and that he could get away with it. But now we're introduced in chapter 12 to his good friend Nathan. And it says, And the Lord sent Nathan unto David. Notice, the Lord is the one that's sending. The Lord is the one that's in control of this. Why is that? I think because... Once again, it demonstrates the love that God has for David. As you look at this story, I think if I was in the position of God, which I never would want to be or claim to be, I would have thrown that guy out a long time ago for what he did. But the depths of God's love. Well, Arnie sang about it tonight. We were worshiping the Lord. As we look at our own life, aren't we glad that the Lord's sent people into our path to tell, tell us about the grace and the love of Jesus and give us an opportunity to repent. And it tells us that he came unto him and he said unto him, there were two men in one city, the one rich, the other poor. The rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herd and the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb and he, and he brought up and nourished up and grew up together with him and with his children and did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup and laid in his bosom and was, one, and was unto him as a daughter. 
I, when I saw this, and I was reading, I think, the last Sunday morning, I had to have a chuckle with this one, where this little lamb became like his little girl. You know, I don't know, if they have seen the craze the last few years. seemed like now everybody in every neighborhood and every grocery store has a little dog walking around, right? That's the new phase. And I, at first I was going like, how could that ever happen? Well, we see this guy falling in love with his, with his lamb. It was a source of comfort to him. And, and so he nourished this one little lamb. Maybe you've got a little lamby at your house, a little kitty cat or a little dog, and you can relate to what he's talking about in this case. And he says, and there was a traveler, in verse 4, under the, uh, under the rich man, and he spared to take of his own flock and his own herd. Otherwise, somebody came into town. He didn't want to butcher any, any of his lambs or take anything that was his to dress for the way, wayfarer man that was come unto him, but took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for a man that was come to him. This, you know, sometimes you look at this and you forget all the emotions that must have been going on at that time. Your own dog, you know, I, I said dog because I relate to dogs, but his only lamb. He was treating it to her as his own daughter, and all of a sudden this guy comes, hey, you know, they start yanking it away. But yet he did this. Of course, David, verse 5, are going back to our king now as Nathan's telling him this story. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said unto Nathan, As the Lord liveth, this, the man that has done this thing shall surely die. Speaking of his self-righteousness, and you know, as he's seeing this scene, and he will restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no many, uh, no pity. And finally the kicker in verse 7. And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Can you imagine this? Time has now passed. The, the dirty deed has been done. He thought everything was okay. He's, everything's resolved David might have been still, go, still going to the sanctuary. He might have been still going to the offerings and the feasts, and there's no reason why you wouldn't think that he wouldn't be doing that because that was normal for his lifestyle and for what the king was doing. There's a lot of times people will go to church, and they'll go through it covering up still the unresolved sin in their own hearts. And David was told by Nathan, he says, Thou art the man... Thou says the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over the Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. Nathan's given him a refresher course. He says, this is what God did for you. I gave thy master's house and thy master's wives unto thy bosom and gave thee the house of Israel and Judah. And if that was been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee such and such things. He says, I would have poured out my blessings upon you. God was wanting to give him everything that he could ever imagine. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in what? In his sight. Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and hast taken the wife to be uh, taken the wife to be thy wife, and hast slain him with the sword on the children of Ammon. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from thine house, because thou hast despised me and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will rise up evil against thee in thine house, and I will take thy wife before thine eyes and give him unto thy neighbor, and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of the sun, for thou did it secretly. But I will do this thing before all Israel, and before the uh, son. You know, there is consequences to sin. There is actions to be paid. And certainly as we go through the rest of the second Samuel, we'll see this portion right here played out in the life of David. But the, the thing is so beautiful in verse 13 is what David did when he was confronted with sin. Rather than trying to cover it off, cover it up, or rather trying to blame shift it, you know, it was really Bathsheba that caused all this problem. You know? 
What does David said on David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. This morning we were in Psalm 51. A great companion psalm, because really it's the repentive psalm of David. Is I believe it was penned or, or, or really dealt with after being confronted with Nathan right now. Is one of the beautiful things that David said there in Psalm. He says, Lord, you desire truth and truth in the inward being. I can't hide that from you. As we hear him declare, he says, Lord, I have sinned. That's all God's ever looking for us from us is our confession showing our need for forgiveness that's what the lamb of god is all about when john the baptist finally looked at jesus coming up the way and he says behold the lamb of god that does what that takes away the sins of the world it's by jesus that's able to to remove that guilt david cries out here in psalm, in psalm 51 he says Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Later on, he writes, he says, Oh, how blessed, oh, how happy is the man whose sins are forgiven. David, I believe, during this period of time, even though he's conducting himself as sin, he's realizing that there's no joy in his heart. That's what sin does. It robs us from our walk with the Lord. And he says, I've sinned against the Lord. And David said unto, I mean, Nathan said unto David, the latter part of verse 13, The Lord also has put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. You almost can see the weight of sin, the weight and the burden of sin in David's life being lifted off his shoulder there in that verse. Do you remember when you came to Christ? That first time that you realized that you're forgiven of, uh, of your sin, I remember felt like I was running, you know, five feet off the ground. I've been five feet, ten feet off the ground ever since that day. I still haven't got over the fact that Jesus loves me and that he paid for my sin. And, you know, as I stand before you tonight as the pastor here at Agape Chapel, let me declare unto you, I still do sin. I don't want to. David willfully sinned against the Lord. That's known as transgression. You, we do sin. We do miss the mark. And that's a, a, a Greek word that we like to use. It's armatia. What they would do there in back the times of the Greek, they would put a hoop up on the wall, or way up on a wall someplace. Probably was the first thoughts of competitive Greek games that they have. And they would, somebody would have, you know, they like shooting arrows back then. And he said, hey, maybe a bunch of guys got together. Let's see if we could make, shoot an arrow through those hoops up there. And the idea, if you didn't make it through, it was the word armatia. I missed the mark. Yes, and I'm so thankful that as like David, when I find out that I missed the mark, if I confess my sins before the Lord, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, that's ever make an intercession for us. The difference between David and, like I mentioned this morning, and Pharaoh, and the difference between David and Saul, those men, we don't have recording, uh, any recording that they repented. They asked forgiveness. That's why the Bible says that David was a man after God's own heart, that he was willing to seek the Lord in forgiveness. And then he tells him, thou shalt not die. Isn't that the promise for you here tonight? And one day Jesus said, concerning his friend who died, you know, Mary and Martha were pretty upset. He said, they simply said to him, do you believe in the resurrection? And they said, oh yeah, Lord. We believe in the resurrection. And Jesus simply says, if you believe in me, though you should, are dead, yet you shall live. I've shared that in many funerals in my past. And nowadays, we don't necessarily see caskets so much at a funeral. You know, normally it's a memorial. But when I have had a casket sitting there, I, says, I can look at a, a visual evidence. It says, though they are dead, they're gone. The, because of the forgiveness of Jesus Christ, guys, we'll never die. That's good news here tonight, isn't it? Uh, can you imagine David all of a sudden standing there, and Nathan says, guess what? You'll never die. But also, 
what a man sows, so shall he reap. There's consequences to be paid. As he goes on in verse 14, how be it, how be it, because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. So, you know, there's some portions of scriptures, guys, I just don't understand. You just read it. It's just there. I understand, you know, the, all the emotions of what's going on. But one of the things that we see that sin does through our disobedience is other people make fun of us. You ever hear this phrase? I thought you were Christian. I thought you were godly. I thought you carried your Bible. I thought you prayed, and now you're doing this. And that's what sin does. And he says, you're the person, that little child is going to die. And we're going to deal with that next week as we'll look a little closer to that. In verse 15, and then Nathan departed unto the house, unto the house, and the Lord struck the child, and Uriah's wife bared unto David, and was very sick. And David therefore besought God for the child. And David fasted and, and went in and laid all night upon the earth. And the elders of the house arose and went with him to, rise, to, to raise him up from the earth. But he would not, neither did he eat bread with them. And it came to pass on the seventh day that, that the child died. And the servants of David feared to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, Behold, while the child was yet alive, we spake unto him. And he would not hearken unto our voice. How will he then vex himself if we tell him that the child is dead? And when David saw that his servants whispered, David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore David said unto the servant, Is the child dead? And they said, He is dead. And David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his apparel and came into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Then he came to his own house, and when he, he required, they set bread before him, and he did eat. Beautiful, beautiful story. David, I also, as you go through the Psalms, one of the things that we see is he, when he walked with the Lord, that David was a man of prayer. He knew the power of prayer. He knew the power of intercession. And I'm sure he's thinking, if the Lord, if there's any way that you could put that upon me rather than my child, I want it to be done. And as he's interceding, he's just looking and asking God to, to step in. But once the child was gone, he got up. The issue's over. Verse 21, And then said the servants unto him, What, what thing is this that thou hast done, that thou fast and weep for the child while it was alive? But when the child was dead, thou didst rise and eat bread. And he said, while the child was yet alive, I fasted and weep. And said, who could tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live? Great question. We don't know, do we? Really speaks of, of the sovereignty of God. That God's ways so often are not our ways. And he's saying, David is at this point, he's, he's no longer king. He's a dad. He's a father. And he's realized the, what he did, and he just called it upon the mercies and the grace of God. And in verse 23, he says, but now he is dead. Wherefore shall I fast? Can I bring him back again? No, I cannot. I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. Great story of faith there, isn't he? David kept his eyes upon eternity. He knew the tragedies of this world and the disappointments of this world, that this baby that was born, born is in the presence of the Lord. I believe that children who lose their life as infants, I think because our loving God, and even as we saw here, like David's faith, that we know that God is such a loving the Lord, I think our heaven's going to be filled with a lot of babies, don't you? And nowadays, a lot of unborn babies that'll be in the presence of the Lord. And as we finish up the chapter, I'll let you read that tonight as David and Joab take Rahab, and it continues as, as they take that royal city there. 
And David not only takes the city, he receives all the, the wealth that they have. And as, we, as I mentioned last week that David had this opportunity, you know, he wasn't able to build a temple for the Lord. But David said the next thing, best thing I could do is secure all the supplies, the materials, and the wealth. And as you see him once again uh, going about taking care of business. You know, as we looked at this story, as we opened up, it's not an easy one to look at. David is one of those heroes of faith. But, you know, as I, we went through and we talked about Abraham, you know, he became like a madman down there and, and down there in Egypt because he was concerned. You know, he says, you know, Sarah's not my wife. She's my sister. You look at Moses, the mistakes that he made. He says, I'm not eloquent, Lord. I can't speak. I need to bring Aaron. As you go through and you look at him, you see the flaws of man. In one way, it kind of gives me hope because I got my own flaws. But what it really shows me is that God doesn't throw in the towel to, uh, uh, on any of us. He's faithful to the work that he's doing in our lives. If we're willing just to come to him, even when we do make mistakes, where we say, Lord, please forgive me. Never lose sight that God is our master. He's the master potter. We're on that wheel. And he's molding us and shaping us in order that he might be glorified through our lives as we yield to him. We can try to fight it, but we never win, do we? May we tonight learn from this sin, this great sin of David, that there's grace if we simply turn to him. There's grace in anybody's life. If you run into somebody this week, the most vile sinner that you might ever see, you might, some of those sinners are the ones that you now want to make right turns for the left-hand turn lane right in front of me, you know. <laughs> you know, God loves them. And may our hearts be filled with compassion. And pray for the people that the Lord sets in your life, that they might come to know him as Lord and Savior. Let's go to the Lord and pray.